We have built our world to avoid this. Being stuck out in the cold, leaving ourselves exposed, allowing our bodies to be weather beaten, chilled right down to the bone. This is a place that can easily kill a person. But conditions like this are an obsession for Professor Gordon Giesbrecht. Most important thing right now. This is about survival. He will risk his own skin to discover new ways to conquer cold. I've been hypothermic myself about 30 times. Crazy? Huh? No, this is science. Come, come this far, I gotta finish it up. Giesbrecht sees cold as the enemy. Okay, here we go. As I say, cold is my life. Unfortunately, I hate cold. <laughs> Cold. It is something that a lot of us hate. Yet cold is a fact of life for a huge percentage of the world's population. Many of us believe that cold is something we can try to ignore. We know very little about winter. It is just a season of threat, a season to be avoided. People don't think about winter in any positive way. They don't try to derive value from winter. And that's where the stupidity comes. Science and culture, art and architecture, physiology and psychology, wrapped in the cold embrace. Cold is part of the culture for the Inuit and the Sami. And living with cold is central to life in all northern climes. We confront cold with science to see how severely it threatens us, how it makes our bodies change. Cold is a predator to the unprepared and the unfortunate. And we assumed that she would be very cold and very dead. Everybody dies. Not everybody does it twice. <laughs> Huddle up, because it's time to face the cold. During one trial, the incapacitating effects of cold became apparent in an unexpected way as extended hyperventilation. This poor guy is the star of one of Giesbrecht's own training videos. In this controlled setting, the subject was in no danger. However, in a real life situation, he would have slipped beneath the surface and drowned. Believe it or not, people volunteer to do this, to help study the effects of hypothermia. Giesbrecht's lab at the University of Manitoba is one of a kind. Our lab is ethically approved to cool people lower than anywhere else in the world. The clinical threshold for hypothermia is 35 degrees Celsius. We have ethical approval to cool to 33.5 degrees Celsius. So most of our studies are done, not only are the people cold, but they are actually hypothermic. What's the point? It's that we don't seem to understand how sharply and suddenly cold can hit us. Every year we have people from the city or even from towns out in the country who drive in their car and their car gets stuck or it stalls. Instead of staying in their car where they've got a three quarters of a full tank of gas and they could warm the car up every hour, every year we get stories of people get up and they're going to walk to the next farmhouse and they're found dead in the middle of a field somewhere and this happens all the time. There are 30 to 40 deaths each year in Canada alone because of hypothermia. Giesbrecht figures that most of those deaths are preventable. And he also contends that doctors could save more victims by fully understanding how cold grips us, right down to our very cores. That's where Giesbrecht's cast of lab rats comes in. He has the usual response. Okay. Sometimes it helps when I tell subjects, well, I've done this several times and this is how it's going to feel. And uh, they, they feel more at ease knowing that 
the person who's asking them to do something has done it several times more than them, and uh, so they have some idea of what to expect. Okay, here we have the subject, who's now been in about 40 minutes, shivering quite vigorously. They will have felt really cold, they will have shivered and tried to produce a lot of heat, that's what shivering is, to try and, and prevent or at least slow down the fall to, into hypothermia. and uh, they'll certainly be tired. The blood flow to the periphery, like the fingers and, and toes, hands and feet, will be greatly diminished, if not completely shut down. And uh, as they cool off, you know, below 34 and getting towards 33 degrees, they'll even start to show some, some signs of mental decrement. Uh, physically, they won't be able to do any kind of meaningful activity. Their strength will be greatly diminished. Their ability to do fine movements will be almost completely shot. The stages of freezing are well chronicled in the lab. But what about in the field? Giesbrecht will be using his experience to understand how people survive winter at its most extreme. He'll be going for a three-week hike with no hiding places in the face of severe, unrelenting cold. Cold is insidious. It can creep inside the best parkas. And it can freeze exposed skin if you're not careful. So if you're going to cope with cold, you have to take it seriously. You have to study how the body works under cold conditions in order to understand how to keep cold out. When I started working at the University of Manitoba, I formed a lab which, which studies human responses to extreme exercise in extreme environments. And uh, there are probably not many more extreme type of environments than a polar environment. So I started planning uh, to do a simulated polar expedition on Lake Winnipeg. And uh, I also worked in uh, several research ideas so that I could uh, study the responses during this trip. Okay, so start breathing out outside of the water and then gradually submerge yourself and make sure that there are no more bubbles coming out. The scientific responses will come from Giesbrecht's team of cold weather veterans. Scott Williams is a U.S. Navy SEAL who leads cold weather warfare training in Alaska. His U.S. Navy SEAL colleague is Lieutenant Stuart Kerr, a military doctor from San Diego. John Haynes teaches cold weather survival in the Canadian military. And Randy Engel is a public school teacher from Winnipeg who has no cold weather training whatsoever, except that he's from Winnipeg, the 10th coldest city in the world. One of the things Giesbrecht is planning to prove is that the body can survive three solid weeks of extreme cold exposure without succumbing to hypothermia. These men will be on their own, and they will be reminded of the nuts and bolts of hypothermia from the expert himself. The fatal event in hypothermia is usually uh, ventricular fibrillation or cardiac arrest. It's the heart. So the heart will, if you cool the heart enough, it will eventually stop working. Hypothermia is the central threat to people living in the cold. A normal body temperature measures 37 degrees Celsius. A body is hypothermic when the core temperature, the temperature around the heart and lungs, slips past 35 degrees. A 13-month-old girl wearing only a diaper wandered out of this Edmonton house in the middle of the night. The baby may have been lying in the snow in minus 20 degrees for several hours before she was found by her frantic mother. 
In the winter of 2001, a toddler in Edmonton, Alberta, wandered out into the winter night and froze. Her core temperature plummeted to 15 degrees. That is 22 degrees below normal. Baby Erica was essentially frozen solid. The doctors managed to rewarm her and bring her back without any serious damage. My precious little Erica outside, curled up in a ball, frozen nearly to death. I wish to thank the, the paramedics. She was lucky. The small size of her body meant that her system was frozen quickly. Despite the trauma, she was still in a recoverable state when her mother found her. It is difficult to compare different cases of freezing to death, but doctors can compare record lows in body temperature. And in Scandinavia, there is a story of a Swedish doctor who has been colder than anyone else. How is your body positioned? I had to ask him. Yeah, um, uh, on her back. Uh, with the head uh, downwards. Um, um, with the head under the ice. Dr. Anna Bagenholm was skiing in Narvik, Norway, when she had a freak accident on the surface of a frozen waterfall. She fell and slid through a hole, then got wedged under 30 centimeters of ice, her ski suit filled with freezing, running water. It's a parachute. Yeah. <laughs> parachute the water. And we, we tried to, to lift her up. Uh, but couldn't do it because of the stream. We realized it was, uh, was serious. We did five, six, seven minutes uh, trying to get her out of the water. And then we made this uh, phone call with our cellular phones to get uh, some more help in. I was standing partially in the water, uh, getting uh, soaked by the water, and she was kind of inching herself uh, below the ice. And it's quite frustrating to know that she's 30 centimeters below you, and I can't help her at all. Anna had been conscious in an air pocket under the ice for about 40 minutes. Her friends could see that she was still kicking her feet. Then the kicking stopped. More than an hour later, they finally managed to haul her away from the current, out of a hole they chopped in the ice. At that point, she was, uh, she was dead, like um, clinically dead. Uh, she was pale, not breathing, no pulse, uh, widely dilated pupils, uh, which didn't react to light. Yeah and she had uh, vomit in her mouth. Quite a bad condition. One and of those I days. Don't, I don't remember anything of that. <laughs> I don't remember anything. I remember some things that happened earlier at work this day. And all other things I tell is the story I've kind of made up to myself from all the stories that people have told me. But I mean, the minute she, she came up, I knew what to do. That's uh, when my medical <laughs> training sprang into action, so. So what'd you do? Um, basic CPR. Uh, she was uh, still in the water, and we started uh, giving mouth-to-mouth uh, -mouth and uh, cardiac uh, compressions. Um, and we also covered her with the blankets to, uh, to stop uh, further cooling and, and ongoing CPR. The thing is that uh, in this area, we have, um, you know, north of Norway, they have this... Um, they have already decided that all hypothermic uh, victims should be transferred into the hospital in Tromsø. Because they have a cardiac, like what happened? Cardiopulmonary bypass yeah. unit. A rescue helicopter flew off with Anna more than two hours after she had fallen through the ice. The doctors at Tromsø Hospital have developed an expertise in hypothermia, but they had never revived anyone as cold as Anna. We were already at that time prepared with our set of hair. And we assumed that she would be very cold and very dead. Anna came into Tromsø Hospital with a core body temperature of 14.4 degrees. They hooked her up to an external cardiopulmonary bypass unit. That machine took her blood out of her body, warmed it and pumped it back in again. In the early stages of recirculation, the extremely cold blood from her extremities flowed into the center of her body and dropped the temperature to 13.7 degrees. It's the historically <laughs> lowest temperature recorded uh, of a person with cardiac arrest um, who has then survived. We didn't realize that this was, you know, the lowest in the world because we didn't know at that time, number one, that she would survive, and number two, we didn't care too much about, you know, making records at all. She had 14.4 and then she went down to 13.7. And of course, we all of us knew that this was extremely low, but at the same time, 
a good sign because it meant that her brain might have been very well protected by the cold. I mean, if her central temperature was 14, then her head must have been maybe down to zero. And at that level of temperature, such a cold brain does not consume oxygen at all. So the cardiac arrest, which appeared under the ice and maybe lasted for 40 minutes because before they started CPR, maybe her brain could tolerate that. Since it was so cold, of course, the head will cool much faster than the chest and the heart. So the point about her was that actually her brain arrested before her heart arrested. By this point, Anna's heart had been still for more than three hours. You can't say that the person is dead before the blood flow in the brain stops. So that's the brain dead. And, and I, I had that. I le well, they really didn't know, but I mean, they, they had pressure in the blood. So then the, co the con can't be coagulated blood when they have it. Mm. But I mean, this, this concept is known about uh, hypothermia and, um, and seemingly dead persons. So, so that's, that's the rule of thumb that a cold, cold dead person isn't dead before he's warm again. Having finished the hooking up to the bypass machine, now the blood was going out of her body into the warmer and returned back by the small pump. We had monitoring and we could see the heart was standing without any movement. And at that time we sort of put our hands down because now it was up to this gradual warming of her body to restart her biological functions. And it was a thrilling, hair-raising, magic moment when we saw the first contraction on the echo. We all sighed, and I remember this overwhelming feeling of being very touched. And I think the whole team was, it's like, yes. When, when I, the heart was beating and you have like managed the hypothermia, and then uh, you have to manage the um, I mean, that's, that's just the heart. Yeah. Um, you don't know what had happened to all the rest of the organism. By and large, she died many times in the ICU. She had trouble from all possible organ systems. From the brain, from the heart, from the lungs. Mm. Blood clotting? Yeah, the blood clotting was totally bad because it was bleeding from everywhere. I um, had the, the pancreas was not working. I had, uh, I had this... Uh, kind of um, temporary di diabetes. From the infectious system or the uh, immune system, from the nerves. The intestine, the whole uh, membrane, the mucosa fell off. So I was kind of bleeding from the intestine for five, six days. The peripheral nerves uh, and uh, from the skin. And the thing that has uh, kind of uh, influenced my life mostly was that uh, when I uh, when I woke up from the neck and down, I was paralyzed. Yeah, I mean the first days was. Uh, young people and also elder people in this uh, hospital before uh, from drownings, from uh, snow avalanches and so on. But at some point they have all died in the intensive care unit and most of them who we thought would survive died from brain swelling. Anna's survival is a marvel. It's a cruel cold trip. The frigid water killed her and at the same time saved her. It was a little too much for her to bear once she woke up. The patient from hell. <laughs> <laughs> Another kind of person I... Like, oh, quite angry with us. Yeah, I was point. angry with him because uh, when I woke up I was kind of paralyzed and I thought he, all my <laughs> friends, he should know that I would not be... I, I, I don't want to be here in this bed for the rest of my life. So I kind of had to argue a bit <laughs> with him. <Yeah. laughs> but I, I apologize later. And I think we have learned three things. Number one, never give up. Number two, never give up. Number three, never give up. When you decide to try to save another hypothermic person, that you can't... Uh, in my case, everybody thought she's gonna be brain damaged, but I'm not. <laughs>
at least I don't think I don't, I don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't Don't look at me. <laughs> you can't um, you can't decide if it's uh, if it's worth trying before you have the the end result. So you have to try. She had a complete paralysis of both legs, both arms. She could only move her head a little bit. She was completely depending on a ventilator. She had wasted uh, at least, I think, 60% of her normal weight. I knew that things uh, just had, I had to give it time. And uh, because I saw that I, all, I got better and better very slowly, but I saw that and then I thought it's impossible, uh, it's, it's in, in unnecessary to, to be angry with this, I can be angry with other things. And then suddenly I could ski again and then I said, oh, maybe I can be bike, go on my bike in the summer and then suddenly I could go on the bike and then yeah. then I can, so, and then I, I have sta started to do sea kayaking now. <laughs> so that is all. It's quite important in the start, I guess, to, uh, to prove that you can do the things you did before. Yeah. I was uh, skiing again the first time of the 17th of October. That was on the flat. <laughs> yeah, I like this one. It was one. really difficult. <laughs> <laughs> difficult with the hands. Despite the debilitating damage to her body, Anna was skiing just six months after her accident. In fact, most of her rehabilitation has been done on the ski slopes and hills around Norway. Now she is getting even stronger, but she is still severely underweight and she doesn't have full mm -hmm. use of her hands. She has to use Velcro to attach her ski poles. She came from a life which was extremely active with a very high level of control, and she wanted to get back to that, and she never gave up. I don't want to be in a kind of a rehabilitation center anymore. That was really bad. But they, they are not so, well, at least where I was, Dying. they couldn't uh, accept that people are different. The people need different kind of uh, rehabilitation. So dying was, was okay, but rehabilitation was hell. Yeah, actually, <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't prefer, as I, I know everybody's gonna, everybody dies. Not everybody does it twice. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I missed the first time, so I'm... Yeah. Gordon Giesbrecht has spent a lot of time contemplating cold. Before he was a physiologist, he was a guide. He knows the wilderness as well as he knows his science. He also knows that some people can deal with cold far better than others. In the Arctic, he has seen how Inuit hunters can tolerate vicious cold without much discomfort. The wind here is sending the thermometer down to minus 25 degrees. Yeah, there we go. It's coming up. Bubbling. Mark Ulikitak yeah, like has that. no problem wearing skimpy gloves and rinsing his hands off in seawater. To anyone with less cold tolerance, this water would feel like needles stabbing into flesh. That's why Giesbrecht goes to where the experts are. I am a seeker of thermal comfort. I don't like being cold, so I will do whatever I can uh, to be warm in a cold environment. It's a good time to have a look at your gloves. I'll well, look for things, I'll study things, or I'll learn from other people. So you would fish with these all day? Yeah. Just sitting like this? Mm -hmm. Oh, man. That's enough of a test for me. <laughs> I'll, put, I'll go with these. Like I try to learn from the Inuit up in the north. Anything I can that'll help me, uh, I'll use. And then I figure if, if I can use something to keep myself comfortable, then it's worth teaching to others. Giesbrecht is armed with an exceptional knowledge of cold and physiology. He'll need it, because he's about to be colder than he's ever been before. He's going to lead his team on a 428-kilometer deep winter walk. Five men, one million steps. No shelter other than a tent, no supplies other than what they can carry. He expects their bodies to change. Giesbrecht hopes to turn them into a self-contained, cold-adapted unit. Well, we did several research aspects here. The first, uh, simplest thing was we were comparing clothing and food. 
Okay, so we're going to put the main meal inside of here. Yeah. Right. Main meal will go in one of these packages and then yeah, yeah. with all the, all the daily snacks to eat. When we talk about being out in the cold, we are talking about generating heat. Our bodies work hard in the winter just to stay warm. So when we ski or chop wood, we are adding to the workload. An average person in a temperate environment consumes about 2,500 calories a day. Giesbrecht knows from experience that work under cold weather conditions requires a huge increase in calories. These guys will be eating an average of 4,700 calories a day. They will also be trying to build a better parka. The clothing, we had uh, three sets of clothing for each group of three and, and one group of two. And every three days we switched the clothing and compared it. They got the most advanced cold weather outfits from the Canadian and U.S. militaries. And they got some top-of-the-line store-bought gear. Some of those uh, SDBs, sawdust bars. They'll try to judge which coat works best. Giesbrecht is taking extensive measurements of each man's heart rate, body weight, fat percentage, oxygen consumption. He'll compare this information with measurements during the expedition and after they finish. The other thing that we were doing throughout the expedition was measuring body temperature. In this case, we had uh, pills that were about that big, and uh, we swallowed them, and they emit a, 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 radi a radio signal at a frequency that changes with temperature. And it will uh, indicate every five minutes my core body temperature. Right. So then we'll be able to uh, study the week that I'm wearing a certain clothing. I know that my temperature was this. And then we carried a, about a cigarette pack size uh, receiver in a belt for 19 days. And it received the radio signal and, and converted the frequency into temperature. It's not digestible, only it'll come out. And uh, hopefully we don't run out of something. <laughs> so uh, no, we have lots that are available to us. So every two, three days, I'll have to get another one and uh, go for it. Well, go ahead and swallow your transmitter. All right, here we go. This is the wash down liquid. <clears throat> Tastes like chicken. You are now online. I'm now online. That's right. <laughs> the north end of Lake Winnipeg has been a gateway for centuries. The fur traders traveled from here into the river system that flowed north. But Giesbrecht's crew will be heading south. That's the only thing you really have to do outside. The details are covered one more time. Last bits of business are finished amid the gear piled in a Grand Rapids motel room. Giesbrecht hopes that by putting this group of adventurers through a three-week intensive, frigid experience, he will be able to draw a clearer picture of how human bodies adapt to the cold. We were actually doing analysis all the time. Uh, we drank uh, water that was labeled with uh, isotopes, uh, and then we collected urine every five days. And the analysis of the isotope levels in the urine is used to estimate how much energy was used in each of those five-day periods. You're good for now. Go as at will. But tomorrow morning. At your leisure. Tomorrow morning, all your urine's mine. <laughs> I just got that warm, cozy feeling. Each body here is a research tool. Giesbrecht will carefully analyze how each man performs, pulling a 70 kilogram sled up to 24 kilometers a day in temperatures dipping as low as minus 37 degrees. Lake Winnipeg is Giesbrecht's frozen nemesis. He's tried to walk it twice before, but he only managed to traverse half the lake each time. It was just too cold and too far. The new quest for survival starts here. If you hate winter, this is your nightmare.
There are no peaks to scale out here, no records to be broken. This is simply an exercise in survival and, well, exercise. This is a test in endurance now, and they're into a routine. They walk for 50 minutes, they break for 10. I designed it uh, so that it would probably take us 20 days to do the whole length of the, of the lake. We started going eight miles a day, then we increased it to 10 and then 12, and then we hit our sort of daily goal of 13 to 14, which we continued till the end. Uh, this gave us time to get used to working together as a team, and also getting used to pulling a sled because even if you're in shape, pulling a sled uses different muscles than most of us use normally. So we had to get used to that. And, and it worked out really well. Scientific tests are a little more difficult to perform out here than they were back in the laboratory. It's not as easy to give a urine sample when the wind chill is minus 35. Out on Lake Winnipeg, deep in the heart of winter, it's easy to portray cold as the enemy. But what about the other side of cold? What about how it affects our senses? Every winter, on the banks of the Tourna River, a group of artists and businessmen builds a hotel completely out of ice and snow. The Ice Hotel is a celebration of winter, 100 kilometers above the Arctic Circle. Each year, different sculptors carve out frozen visions of winter, so tourists from around the world can shell out thousands of Swedish kroners for a cold night's sleep. A room like this costs about $430 a night. It started uh, 12 years ago. We had to find out a way of making a tourist attraction of the winter. And uh, what we have most is cold climate. Long, long winter. From uh, early October, we have uh, snow and ice here. And uh, minus 40 degrees sometimes. It's uh, a long winter. And uh, anyway, we started with a few ice sculptures down the river and uh, after a while we found out how to make the ice hotel. We take uh, about 10,000 tons of ice from the river. And with that ice, we are making all the ice pillars and all the ice carvings here. The Turner River freezes more than two meters thick. The water is unpolluted. So these 1,500 ton blocks of ice emerge crystal clear, perfect for sculpting. We have a lot of good uh, ice and snow builders and uh, many ice carvers. Every ice carver here, they have a special project. It could be a sweet or just sculpture or the ice gallery, for instance. Even the vodka glasses are made of ice. Bartenders go through 2,000 a week. No matter what the temperature is outside, the interior of the ice hotel remains a constant minus five degrees. It's a balance of temperature and insulation and it all melts away by May. But there will be an entirely new ice hotel up and running by next November. This time in February is about the month before the uh, uh, equinox. And so the sun is very strong. And uh, it's like it is in mid-October, you know. But the uh, sun in mid-October is blocked by foliage yet, and there's no snow cover. But this time of year, the world is never more brilliant.
hundred years ago, when this was an agrarian country, winter was the favorite season. There was no agricultural labor to be performed at the levels that were in the summer. The uh, food supply was already in. And the work that they wanted to do, like building, could take place very easily. Uh, you could move very heavy loads in the winter with uh, very little horsepower. You know, logs, things of this sort could be moved on sleds. And so this was the favorite time of year. It's the time of year that people could get together for social activity. But we gradually lost that as we urbanized. The issue is we live in a cold climate but we very seldom get cold stressed because we work inside, we have our cars are at worst plugged in with a car heater, but at best they're in an indoor garage. We fear winter. The fear has been promoted by the media and either, I'm afraid, even Environment Canada, which uh, centers on the hazards and people are afraid of uh, damage to themselves. Uh, freezing, you know, or getting cold. They seem to think that getting cold is the same as getting sick. It's not. The tilt of the earth, fewer hours of daylight, chilling winds from the north, they all contribute to this season of plunging thermometers. Some of us react by turning away, by struggling through the season. People can get the winter blahs, cabin fever, or the more serious clinical condition known as seasonal affective disorder. Seasonal affective disorder is a mild to moderate depression where people feel less energetic, they feel slightly disorganized, decision making is difficult, and you know, you can call that a syndrome and use a label to describe it, or you could look at it as if it, these are, 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 are normal reactions to our environment that require you to have a slightly different attitude about living and about yourself. SAD is selective. It doesn't hit everybody. Recent Canadian studies show that northern native people rarely develop SAD. Perhaps prevention lies in a willingness to embrace winter. My view is that almost all sad can be cured by getting out and doing something out of doors. In sub-zero societies everywhere, outdoor festivals help break up the long winter months. In Quebec, they have the Carnaval. In Japan, there's the Sapporo Snow Festival. And in the Yukon, they remember the gold rush at the Sourdough Rendezvous. These festivals are reminders that neighbors exist, that a deep freeze is something that connects people. In these places, cold creates an integral sense of community. Psychologists believe that is being lost when people turn on the TV, pull down the blinds, and try to live out their long, cold winters alone. Because we've been disconnected from a natural rhythm, it's harder to feel good sometimes, especially when it's cold or it's a challenging environment to be in. And we're losing a lot of things that make us psychologically healthy, uh, such as being able to interact and socialize. We're a social species, and we're losing a certain ability to be social animals. The closer to the North Pole one gets, the longer winter gets. Higher latitudes mean shorter days, and choosing to live a life here can be daunting. But for many people, choosing to live here is the point. It's wide open, and it's beautiful. They don't mind putting in the effort. In Acapulco, relaxation is your friend and activity is your enemy. 
But in the north here, it's the opposite. Relaxation is your enemy, and activity is your friend. I think it depends on people's ability to embrace the cold in a way, rather than to feel embraced by it. It's attitude. and, and at, just as our body reacts to the cold, if we tense up against it, it's harder to be in it. If you can open yourself to the weather and not uh, look at it as the enemy, then I think it's much easier to survive in the north and to feel a part of the, the landscape and the seasons. When we come back, facing a place where the cold is relentless, walking into the frozen heart of winter. few hundred kilometers into their march, and Giesbrecht's team members are constantly reminded of the basic lessons of life out here. That's a lot of energy, a lot of energy, and food. Food is everything out here. Food is everything and wind sucks. Everything else is gravy. <laughs> this ought to make it regular. STB? Or Big Newton. Big Newton. Wow. Every day we were taking in 4,700 calories. And after about the first two or three days, everybody was pretty well eating everything. So we know that we're eating 4,700 calories a day. And uh, well, that, that still was wasn't enough. That one meal from last night just didn't quite cut it. A pound uh, of fat is 3,500 calories. Right. So we were eating the equivalent of a pound and a half of fat a day, and we were still losing weight. We're back home, I wouldn't give these things a second look. Get them to the last crumb now. Remit the calorie. Captured in the good times, in the romance of winter. Then there are those other memories, the reality, the day-to-day -day experiences of living with the cold. The 60s and the early 70s were extremely cold. Uh, wintertime temperatures of 50 below, 60 below were common, and they would last two to three weeks. It just there has been, whether it's climate change or what's going on, but it isn't as cold as it used to be. The coldest uh, I had gone on to visit, an oil exploration camp about 200 uh, kilometers north of Dawson City, and that was in early March, and we went down to minus 65, minus 75 Fahrenheit, and uh, we had gone up in a, an ordinary truck, and in our driving, our side windows, our side, side uh, rear view mirrors fell off. The metal had actually crystallized and everything uh, fell off and it was a hairy situation. You knew that if the thing, if your machine broke down, you could be in real trouble in a hurry because it was so darn cold. Where are the frigid winters of yesteryear? Conventional wisdom and environmental science say the earth is warming up. The ice caps will melt, the ocean levels will rise, the climate will change. Climate change is actually the norm. Uh, if the climate changes, the climate is not changing, then there's something weird going on. I mean, the climate has always been changing throughout the history of the Earth. Our detailed meteorological records barely go back a century. Eric Blake designs drilling machines to take cores out of glaciers. Trapped in the cores are elements that can be analyzed, allowing scientists to track weather patterns back through the last ice age. 
The story told in these cores is that the Earth has gone through many warming and cooling trends on its own. There's no question that climate change has been accelerated by human activity. Um, I think what we're seeing is a superposition of a natural warming trend which has been going on since pre-industrial times. Um, certainly in the last century there has been a warming trend. That's irrefutable. Uh, and it, uh, but it has its ups and downs. I remember when I was going to high school in the 70s, late 70s, that uh, the, the, the thing then was, uh, that was in all the media was you know, the onset of the next glacial s glaciation. Um, so the climate at that time was experiencing a cooling for a period of a few years, but, but that's, if you look at a longer record that goes over hundreds of thousands of years, it's filled with ups and downs and blips and turnarounds. Whether the Earth is warmer now matters little to someone dealing with a day at minus 25. Therein lies the problem. Cold weather people are proud, even boastful, about their hardiness. It's just putting up with days like this that tries people's patience. When we come back, we'll look for the core of our love-hate relationship with winter. You know, we think we're really, really cold if we had to stand at a bus stop for 10 minutes or if we had to walk two blocks to get to a store. If we had to walk to the 7-Eleven instead of driving to it, heaven forbid. And, uh, you know, so we never have to deal with cold for a long period of time. Why fear the cold? With the proper clothing and the right attitude, it's easy for Tom Nelson to make the best of a cold day in Edmonton. All he needs is a spot in the sun and minus 20 feels pleasant. But still, he gets frustrated, because when they built the rest of Edmonton, the northernmost major city in Canada, they blocked out the sun. The place we just came from was sunny, and there was almost no wind. Here, the wind has picked up considerably. There's no sun. It would be unpleasant to sit outside, and the uh, and the tall buildings here provide the basic problem, you know. They make a sort of wind tunnels and uh, they completely block the uh, sun. The crux of Nelson's problem is that we've taken a standard city design and plopped it down in a cold region. The buildings, the pavement, the cars, the material and technology used here are pretty much the same as they use in Florida. The northern cities were never, in a sense, meant to be. <laughs> you know, they, they required a technology that uh, had not been developed. So we took the Southern technology. Kirina, population 26,000, Sweden's northernmost city. I don't know about any city that has, to such an extent, tried to build for the winter climate as far as Kirina has. Kirina is the product of a Nordic utopian vision. When it was established 100 years ago by a mining company, the mine owners knew that they wanted a stable, happy workforce. So they wanted a livable winter city. The streets were curved so that thoroughfares wouldn't become wind tunnels. Architects planned the downtown so that small, sheltered squares would promote pedestrian traffic and gathering places. They wanted to encourage family and community. What they didn't want was a typical frontier mining town of transient workers and streets lined with saloons. <laughs> oh, 
This is a really demanding environment. It demands a lot. Especially about organization and planning and knowledge. City planners took a look at their location and worked from there. They established Kirina on the lee side of a low mountain, sloped to take full advantage of the short hours of daylight in the winter. The first homes were placed in sheltered, attractive areas. It gave the feeling of living in a park and encouraged social activity, even in the long, dark winter months. Sundstrom is designing new buildings here to deal with Arctic environments. Structures that take cold into account from the drawing board on up, like the school in Kirina. The point of the structure is light. This far north of the Arctic Circle, winter light is hard to come by. So Sundstrom made the most of his southern exposure to let as much light in as possible. It makes the idea of winter less psychologically threatening. I mean, we are uh, biologically built to be in daylight, I think, not in electric light. We evolve, we migrate, we change. Cold isn't all bad, it's a climate we choose to live in. People in the cold have always determined their own levels of tolerance. They naturally find ways to live with the climate, to pace out their long winter months, and to make winter psychologically appealing. One of the best parts of winter, though, is spending a day like this and curling up by the fire at home at night. Can't do that out here. Humans have a small ability to adapt to cold stress. But is this something we should push? How far can we go in making ourselves winter creatures? The Million Step March is moving along surprisingly well. It is actually ahead of schedule. Their bodies are more tolerant of the cold now. Their appetites are voracious. Ironically, Giesbrecht is the only one feeling some discomfort. He hurt his knee before he left for this trek, and he's got a touch of frostbite on his face. People often get frostbite and hypothermia uh, mixed up. Um, hypothermia is the lowering of the core of the body, lowering of the temperature below 35. Uh, frostbite is the freezing of tissue, usually the fingers and the toes or the nose might be first. Uh, they can come together or they can be completely separate. For instance, you could have a really good parka and lots of good clothing on and you might lose a boot and you might step in some water and uh, an hour later your foot might be completely frozen solid but you might be totally normal thermic. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if the temperature was five degrees Celsius and it was windy and raining, uh, you could be very hypothermic uh, to the point of dying, but because the temperature is above zero, you would have no frostbite. Often, frostbite and hypothermia show up at the same time because the kind of cold stress you're in leads to both. Even with all of the preparation, Cold is still relentless in its attempt to get in and cause problems. But to anyone who lives in cold, that should be no surprise. A lot of us just grit our teeth and head indoors. Uh, we have a saying, there's no such thing as a cold Norwegian. Uh, Norwegians certainly are well able to uh, dress correctly when they go out. The port town of Tromsø in Norway, which lies just below the 70th parallel, that is several hundred kilometers north of the Arctic Circle, on par with the north end of Baffin Island. Tromsø was built here to benefit from the Gulf Stream, which flows north along Norway's west coast. The ocean never freezes and winter coastal temperatures stay relatively reasonable. But winter does last a long time here. 
At Tromsø University, they are just starting to do tests on how even moderate cold can affect elderly people, people whose aged bodies take a long time to rewarm. James Mercer is beginning to discover that even minor drafts can drastically affect an elderly person's resilience to cold. So what happens? The same thing that happens in a lot of cold weather cities. They turn up the heat and isolate themselves from the world outdoors. People will often say to me, well, I come originally from Ireland, and they say, now you're living in northern Norway, and you must get used to the cold and, and cold adapted. And strangely enough, it's quite the opposite. Uh, I have become rather spoilt uh, living in Norway. I live in a very well insulated house. Um, I w my working place is, I think, too warm. Public transport is too warm, and so on and so forth. Too warm. It doesn't have to be that way. Take Edmonton, for example. They can't move it to the sunny side of a nearby mountain. The downtown is permanently established on the bluffs over the North Saskatchewan River. But these buildings are expensive to heat. Tom Nelson says the thermostats are set too high in the winter. We heat the whole room, you know. Now, if I would take a match to heat this room, to raise the temperature, and I hold it up here, you couldn't measure the contributions that that makes to temperature. But now, if I would take that same match, light it, and hold it over your hand, you'd have more heat than you can stand. So if you deliver the heat to the proper places, and that can be regulated by the individual themselves at that workstation, then you have a situation where you use minimal amounts of energy and people are maximally comfortable. So Nelson has developed this lightweight, inexpensive personal heater. One of these under each desk means the money-guzzling thermostat can be turned way down. But it goes under the desk like this, and the individual, then it radiates up through the top here and up through the surface, and it also has a uh, reflector, and the uh, heat can be directed toward the knees or toward the feet, or it can be entirely shut off. This only uses, at maximum, the heat than a 150-watt bulb. I think the main problem with winter is not temperature, but its surfaces. You just can't get about safely. A few years ago, Nelson's wife Elizabeth fell on the ice and broke her hip. So he came up with a winter coat that doubles as body armor. It's a... Uh, a garment that has in it some pads. They do the job without making a person look uh, uh, misshapen. And Nelson uses an alternative to salt. He treads on the ice by using wood chips. What you find with wood products is that they look nice. For older people with restricted vision, that's important. Uh, they also provide very good traction, and they don't get into the uh, river system. But probably one of the finest things about them is when you have a thaw, uh, sand sinks to the bottom, salt becomes dilute, but <clears throat> the wood products float to the top and they freeze in. <laughs> in the spring, the wood becomes mulch and ends up in the garden. But spring is far away, and the Giesbrecht expedition has been in the middle of a frozen lake for two weeks and they've still got 150 kilometers to go. On day 13 and 14, we came to the part of the lake that actually narrows down, and we met a research team from uh, the university. We've been doing well. It's only the second day with a south wind, so it's the only second day we're getting hit in the face. 
science is going great, and, uh, and everybody's happy, everybody's in good shape. So science isn't a dirty word yet? Well, science has been a dirty word since day one, but, you know, we're dealing with it. The first two days we had nice weather, and then after that we've had heavy winds basically for 12 days straight. And last night even setting up the tent, we took four of us just to hold the tent up. And then uh, once everything was set up, calmed down, woke up this morning, signs day, of course everything's perfect. Science day, a key milestone in the million step march. This is the day the team members will be poked and prodded. The day they will give samples of their bodily gases and fluids over to science. Okay, our samples are the most important thing right now. U.S. Navy SEAL Stuart Kerr is the first cold weather guinea pig. They actually set up a, a tent, a laboratory tent, right on the ice bridge. And uh, we also had a testing tent that they moved around as we were going. And, and we actually redid the laboratory studies that we had done in the lab. Those were two-hour tests at two miles an hour. So each subject walked four miles on the treadmill in the lab. And we redid this study right out on the lake. Uh, we walked, each person was tested for four miles. And we set up these laboratory, or these test tents every two miles and they would come and then we would do blood samples like just, just like we had done in the lab and and uh, urine samples okay here we go we got a tissue of blood yeah actually i don't think i have a good whole lot of time i think so uh there's some cotton in there yeah this is cotton even though it's cold, Giesbrecht has found it easier to work without his mitts on for a longer period of time. A small Primus stove is supposed to be heating this makeshift lab, but Giesbrecht and company have no time to wait. The samples need to be taken while Kerr's heart rate is still high. Then he has to hit the trail again. There we go, a piece of tape and a drink. Oh, that's right. I have to have my martini. They have been trading sets of clothes over the last 13 days so that each man will be able to compare the military parkas versus the civilian parkas and record their preferences. Here's some blood. Each night they set up their tents, drill for water, cook dinner, take some readings, and get to sleep, only to do the same thing the next day. Kerr will drink some isotope-laden water. The isotopes act as chemical markers, so scientists can track their progress through the system to gauge the speed of metabolism. Cheers. They need to be careful with this stuff. A bottle of vintage isotope-laden water runs about $1,500. In the time of that was, Each man will undergo these tests. Now it's Randy's turn. Now, we've got large, medium, and small face masks. They are feeling strong, and they are ready to finish. There's about 120 kilometers before they reach their goal. The south end of the lake, and a final trip into Giesbrecht's lab. Gordon Giesbrecht's career is devoted to cold. Hey! If he's doing work, it's on adapting the body to severe temperatures and weather. He's done it all over the world. He's been to conferences in Alaska and workshops in Scandinavia. So it's only obvious that he'd be on the back of an Inuit Kamatik in the middle of the Barrens. I think the majority of the population of Canada, which is within 100 miles of the Canada-US border, don't really understand cold because they don't really experience it. Whereas, you know, up north, 
where a good portion of the population actually make a living going out on the sea ice or out on the land, where it's not a, a five minute walk to 7-Eleven, it's eight hours standing beside a fishing hole or a seal hole, uh, or being out on a skidoo for five hours to set up a tent so you can go hunting for muskox, and then you don't get to go inside your house, you're getting into a tent and you're doing that day after day, these people understand cold. Interesting, we asked one of the guys in Joe Haven, has anybody here ever got frostbite? And the answer was no. I mean, nobody has ever got frostbite in anybody's memory up here in this town. Uh, so, I mean, up here, people understand cold. Joe Haven was a winter base for Norwegian explorer Roald Admundsen before it was an Inuit village. It's named after Admundsen's boat, the Joa. In local lingo, Joa has become Joe. In Admundsen's time, this was nothing more than a safe harbor for his crew. There are 900 people in this hamlet now, descendants of the Netsilic Inuit, the nomadic tribes of the low Arctic islands and north shore of the Nunavut mainland. Gordon Giesbrecht would never have come here without his traveling laboratory. So what's going to happen is you're going to, we're going to put these uh, probes on your fingers, yeah. three of your fingers, and then you'll sit here for five minutes. Mm -hmm. And then we'll put your hand in 10 degree water. Actually warm. Warm. It's a bit warm. Yeah. Giesbrecht found that Mark Ulikitak and other Inuit hunters had an advanced ability to deal with cold. In a test like this, people not used to the cold would exhibit a quick vascular response in their fingers. Their hearts would be rushing blood to the area that needed warming. With the Inuit hunters, that response didn't happen so rapidly. It seemed as if their bodies had different impressions of cold. Do you know what the temperature is outside today? No. Do you have a thermometer out one of your windows? No. no. But we did another test, which I think kind of puts it all together. We went, Mark and I went outside where it was about minus 15 and the wind was really blowing, so the, the wind chill might have been minus 25, minus 30. So we're, gonna, we're keeping them out here so the wind is getting them. That'll cool them off quicker. If we stand inside of here, the temperature is the same, but the wind, there's no wind, so yeah. our fingers won't, won't feel anywhere near as cold. Yeah. In fact, I'm actually going to do that in a minute. I'm going to stand just out of the wind and see if that makes a difference, because my fingers are getting pretty cold. Yours aren't cold at all. No, they're okay. <laughs> oh, man. The issue with wind chill is it depends on whether something is, is inanimate and already uh, ambient temperature or whether it's producing heat like we are. Like wind chill means nothing to a parked car. Yeah, I'm not going to be much longer. Mm -hmm. Two more minutes and... Uh... Right now we're losing heat. Uh, if it's minus 20 here, we'll lose heat at a certain rate from our skin. If it stays minus 20 and we put a fan here or go outside and the wind is blowing by, we will lose heat at a faster rate. The temperature's still minus 20 but we're losing heat at the same rate as, as we might if there was no wind and it was minus 30. My fingers are cold. Mm -hmm. Yours aren't cold. I'm not so do you mind, do you mind stand, standing out here for another 10 minutes? Yeah. Okay, I'm just, basically now my hands, I can't, I could stand a couple more minutes, but I'm feeling like right. much more and I'd start getting yeah. too cold. Yeah. So I'm gonna, first of all, I'm gonna go. Giesbrecht has his computer tucked into Mark's foyer. The readout says that Mark's fingers are actually warmer than Giesbrecht's by several degrees, even though they have both been standing outside for the same amount of time. My fingers are really cold. <laughs> I'm going to put some mitts on and then I'll, I'll keep talking to you. Okay. All I know is my bare hand got, got cold 
so that I couldn't toler tolerate it anymore within about three minutes. And I had to go inside, put a jacket on and mitts on. And, and Mark stood out there for another 10 or 15 minutes. What, what do your fingers feel like right now? Kind of chilly. Kind of chilly. Yeah. Okay. On a, on a scale of 1 to 10, mm -hmm. 10 being painfully cold, what would they be? The number? Probably 7. 7? Yeah. His so how your, your body perception feel right of now? skin temperature okay. was different than seven. mine. Yeah. Well, I think we've, we've shown the, the concept here of how you can deal much better being out here than me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't want your fingers to get too cold, so yeah. we should go inside, okay? Yeah. So you're good? Yeah. You just watch the corner. The sort of uh, unconscious thermoregulatory system responds much the same way. Your finger temperature when, when we were in here was yeah. higher yeah. because you're used to being out where it's cold, so you're, mm -hmm. you're warmer now. Yeah. But then when we went out, mm -hmm. it only took about uh, three or four minutes till my mm -hmm. finger temperature I mean, green here drop really quickly down mm -hmm. to like six degrees. And at that point, this is only two or three minutes. And at that point, I was in a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I could have lasted a few more minutes, but I was time to go back in and put my mitts on. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas you just, you're the yellow here. You lasted another 15 minutes before you reported that your fingers were significantly cold. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we both came inside mm -hmm. and my fingertips warmed up even though they were warmer because mm. they were in the mitts yeah. they warmed up really slowly and you just walked in here and your finger temperature warmed up really quickly so so there's three things first of all you were warmer than me at all times mm -hmm. you were able to tolerate a colder temperature mm -hmm. and you warmed up quicker when you came in mm -hmm. and uh, i mean that's a perfect example of, of how someone like yourself a hunter who goes out on the land when it's cold all the time, or out on the frozen ocean, yeah. uh, is is better adapted to this than someone like myself is. Mm -hmm. So thank you. That was yeah. that was really really good. Yeah. A really good demonstration. It's a dangerous business lumping cultures into physiological categories, saying that who they are predetermines a genetic capability to be better off than another race of people is. But a northern culture like the Inuit is formed by cold. Cold is at the heart of who they are, and it's not just them. They used to call these people Laplanders. They call themselves Sami. They are the cold weather natives of Scandinavia. Europe's only indigenous tribes in the continent's last true wilderness. <laughs> the Sami have herded their reindeer over the plateaus of northern Scandinavia for centuries. They are steadfast as a winter culture, set apart from their Norwegian, Finnish, and Swedish neighbors by language and tradition. Temperatures here can dip below minus 40 degrees, but they tolerate it as a daily part of the job, and the job is herding reindeer. Families work their herds through the winter until the spring migration to the Norwegian coast. They use the skin for clothing and they eat the meat. Owning reindeer is central to the pride of the Sami. How many do you think you have back there? Well, that quite kind of question we don't answer <laughs> because I have heard that um, if you ask me how many reindeer I have, I could ask you how many <laughs> money you have in your in 
on your bank account, <laughs> if you understand. <laughs> The height of winter comes in March, just before Easter, when the Sami traditionally throw their wedding celebrations. The wedding procession leads the community to a ceremony at the local Lutheran church. The bride and groom are joined by their parents and a parade of their unmarried friends. In winter time, you have all together. You see, you see your relatives, your friends, and all around you. <laughs> the Sami are often compared to the Inuit of North America, but it's a different case here. They are an Arctic native culture, but they have closely coexisted and intermingled with other Scandinavian cultures. This mix of blood and tradition makes the Sami identity a particularly delicate one. In the end, they are defined by reindeer, and they are defined by winter. <laughs> a feast of reindeer meat follows the wedding at the community hall in Karashok. For the Sami, winter is a time of regeneration. The herds are all close by, and life is reasonably settled. It's an older rhythm that governs the cycle of a cold weather people. On Lake Winnipeg, they are looking at the final stage of their cold weather odyssey. There's a few steps left before Giesbrecht can finally say, after three tries, that he's conquered Lake Winnipeg. In the annals of exploration history, there have been tragic stories told of expeditions caught out in the cold. Scott, Franklin, Shackleton. Considering the constant exposure to cold over the last three weeks and the 400-odd frigid kilometers of ice behind them, Professor Giesbrecht and the crew of the Million Step March are surprisingly fit. It's interesting. Uh, we started going eight miles a day, worked up to about 13, 14. And then in the last week, we have up to 17, uh, 16, 17. And now today, we only have 11, and we're sort of taking long breaks and trying to relax, and uh, we're just taking our time. It's great. And the second that he, uh, he said that he was starting to doubt That's Giesbrecht's biggest surprise. He said he just He's almost up. planned the trip too well. So I did he expected them to be limping into the finish line, not arriving ahead of schedule. Here, so I'll be... Uh, Giesbrecht had publicized the team's appearance at the finish line for 2 o'clock in the afternoon. At the rate they have been moving, they will cover the last leg too fast and get to the south end of the lake too early for all of the cameras. And when we finished, all of us could have just kept on going. I, I, was, I was really surprised at how strong we were. There's a buzz in Winnipeg, and it goes beyond the families of the expedition team. For nearly three weeks in February, these guys took on colder temperatures than most people would even want to think about. 
Justin. How are you doing, In the last four or five days, uh, certainly we were tolerating the cold better, where we might have, you know, our hands might have been really, really cold during a break before. They weren't quite as cold uh, later on. Well, you know, growing up in Winnipeg, so uh, I kind of knew what to expect. But cold, the big thing is, um, you know, usually in, in the city you can, you can you can get in and out. But here we're always outside, and, and the big one that I noticed was any time you had to do any 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 work and you have to take a glove off you have to do something instantly the fingertips started getting numb and uh, got really really cold so that was the biggest hit right away was the fingers bone chilling at, at some, a couple points and then others that uh, like you're taking clothes off and you're putting clothes on and sometimes you didn't have enough clothes to put on and other times there was just you couldn't ventilate enough 37 below at one point with uh, with 30 knots of wind, so that brought temperatures down quite a bit. We were huddled deep in our jackets and uh, and just wanted to move to keep our uh, keep our heat going. In San Diego, I was in shorts and t-shirts, you know, playing baseball with my sons uh, one day, and then I'm up here, you know, getting smacked in the face with you know real cold weather up here in Winnipeg the next. So it's uh, it's it's interesting how the body adapts. It's the same as any of us who live in a place where there's snow during the winter. In early November, uh, a temperature that will make us feel really cold. Well, when we experience that temperature later on in March, yeah, it's no problem. You know, we'll, we won't have our jacket on and we might not have mitts on. This just happened over a more condensed period of time. How do I like the cold? Cold isn't bad because you can get up in the morning and if you're in a sheltered area and it's minus 34, it's, it's not bad because you can be out and about. But you get a slight wind from that and that cuts and that is the big one. I've always kind of enjoyed the cold. I love the cold. I'm, uh, I'm from the north, I'm from Maine. My wife's a Newfoundlander. So we're, we're used to the cold. We're gonna live in the cold all our lives. This is, uh, I like it. I'm not a true fan of the cold. I figured it out up in Resolute Bay a couple of years ago and I'm saying it again here. I don't like the cold. Three of us make uh, make at least part of our living is teaching this kind of stuff. So we, we all uh, we all learn a tremendous amount. I can do this and I can officially go like that. <laughs> it will take a long time to sift through the data of the body fat tests, oxygen intake tests, cold stress tests, but there is one immediately striking result in their weight loss. Hey, I haven't been 205 in years. <laughs> you outweigh me, brother. I haven't been that way since junior high. By the time we were done, uh, one fellow lost 11 pounds, two of us lost 13 pounds, and two guys lost 19 pounds. A package of bacon and eggs like John is eating, designed for cold weather, has 410 calories and 40% of the daily recommended allowance of fat. That's just breakfast. And that still wasn't enough for these guys to maintain their body weight. I think that we've, you know, lost, you know, definitely a fair bit of uh, lean body mass as well. You know, meaning muscle mass. I gotta eat some of those, uh, some of that Canadian pizza. Oh, oh buddy, I got, uh, was that the order? Yeah, the order is Extra in. large. It's unreal how much, uh, how thin you get out there, especially in parts that you're not using a lot. 9.2? 9.2. You know, it's not like I was out there doing bench press or push-ups or anything like that. So you, I lose a lot in the shoulders and in the uh, neck area. 11.0. 11.0 biceps. I worked in the Caribbean about three years ago, and uh, there it was 100 degrees all the time, and the cold takes more energy out of you. 4.7. The way I figured, I lost a pound a day, and that's a lot of calories. And uh, we weren't carrying enough calories to make that up. Uh, Super Leaf. He's sounding quite uh, scientific there, eh? He is. Pretty good for a sergeant. Us uneducated kind of guys. 15.0. We lost 19 pounds. So it's, uh, you know, Gord Giesbrecht's diet program. Well, I think it's a, it's a great program. Uh, if you pay me $3,000, come with me for three weeks. 
And you can eat all you want. You can eat anything you want and guaranteed to lose pounds after three weeks. <laughs> but if you don't keep up to me for the three weeks, you don't get your money back. Giesbrecht will now spend months analyzing the physical data from his team. From the weight loss, it's obvious that the metabolism changes. But what about the body's ability to deal with cold temperatures? Now you can start it. With these cold water stress tests, Giesbrecht can determine a body's recovery time. The cold water causes the temperature in the hand to drop. The recovery time is the time it takes to get back up to normal body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius. The cold stress tests actually surprised me a bit, um, where I expected us to do better after the 19 days. All of us actually did worse. Well, I can't imagine you putting your whole body in there. I think it's a difference between normal adaptation that we see sort of every day for months or years or a lifetime. Uh, this was this was more than that sort of normal adaptation kind of stress. This was a lot of stress. Like every day, every hour, we were taking our gloves off and and, and trying to fiddle, getting getting our snacks and, and opening thermoses, and and then later on we'd be putting the tent up and cooking and getting the stoves lit all with cold hands. So we actually almost induced some damage. There was another surprise. They wore clothing from the Canadian military, U.S. military, and store-bought civilian clothing. Which was best? Actually, civilian gear really impressed me. I have a lot of good things to say about that. I would take the civilian one, probably top. The commercial stuff was very good. It was excellent because it was very versatile. So it had several layers. It had pit zips everywhere. You could vent. You could shut stuff down. It was a little Inspector Gadget kit, so it was great. The endorsement of civilian clothing comes with a warning, though. There are a lot of winter clothes for sale out there. Giesbrecht has looked at many of them, and he hasn't been overly impressed. You should be able to get a, a decent parka for, you know, 150 or $200, as opposed to these four or $500 parkas. A lot of these uh, very expensive parkas that are, are supposedly made for expeditions and extreme weather wear, they're really not designed very well, and... Uh, they, they're, they're more made as fashion garments than, than actual expedition gear. Scott Williams will be using the comments on clothing to build a better parka for the U.S. military. Go, keep going, keep going, keep going. Go, 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 all the way, all the way. Okay, good, good. No severe frostbite, no <laughs> hypothermia. I'm sure that looked good. Giesbrecht is satisfied that he has held the cold at bay at least for now. The team will disperse after this, back to San Diego, Alaska, a Canadian Forces base, and a Winnipeg suburb. Everybody has had enough cold, except for Professor Giesbrecht. This is an obsession for him. There's no end to his research. Giesbrecht could have chosen to study heat, but cold has an allure. It's invigorating, but it's also dangerous. On his Lake Winnipeg trek, he learned that it takes even more calories than he had planned on to keep a team working well out in the cold. He also learned that he could expect the body to make physiological changes to deal with the cold, but only so much change can happen over a certain period of time. It takes a lifetime of exposure to endure cold the way these Inuit hunters can. Life in an everyday hunt can only provide Giesbrecht with more ammunition against winter in his cold weather arsenal. We know about the, about the fur clothing, the, the caribou parkas and the polar bear pants. And I think down south we get the idea that, well, this is kind of sort of a ceremonial dress kind of thing. But, you know, we've actually seen these guys wear it for real. They're going out on their skidoos and they're going to go 40 miles today and the wind is howling and it's minus 20 and 
and they're wearing this. That's their actual functional clothing, which is very nice to see, not just something that, that's ceremonial in a book, trying to remember something from the past. And then he's gonna he's gonna dig them in this way, right? Yeah, he's dig them all the way right. Way. Yeah. And then you've got the, the shelf. Yeah, beauty. Perfect. There are two interesting things about an igloo. One is the fact is its insulation value, and one is its structural integrity. It's built in a dome shape so that the pressure on any portion of it actually is is supported by the rest of the dome. And um, the other part is the insulation value. Uh, you know, the walls are about four to six inches thick, and snow is not all snow. There's a lot of air trapped inside it, and it's this air that's trapped inside that actually provides an insulation. It's amazing that these pieces stay up. Will they ever fall down on you guys? How much are you looking forward to sleeping in it tonight? Oh, it's going to be great. There'll be lots of insulation in there, and uh, I'm uh, planning to be perfectly comfortable. Okay. Go ahead, take your seat. Hey, thanks. There's a fine line between being cozy and dying from exposure out here. But this igloo went up in only an hour. With the heat of a camp stove, it's warm enough for Professor Giesbrecht to take off his parka, and quiet enough so that the howling winds which will kick up, won't make any difference tonight. The discipline of science, the necessities of life, wrapped in the cold embrace. It's where we live, a place that demands our full concentration. Because it's cold outside, and most of us still have a lot to learn. <laughs> <laughs> 